loud. Tim, great to be with you. I appreciate you having me back. Yeah, it's, it's always um, 33. important for us to get from the medical professionals what's really going on. And, and the reason I asked you on today is, you know, with the Delta that's going around, there's a lot of fear. A lot of people are afraid. Yes. You know, and, and there are people getting sick. Uh, we even have some people that I know that are, are close to my family that they're in the hospital right now. They're on a ventilator. This is scary stuff. Yes, it is. But it doesn't have to get to that. No. And that's what you're here to talk about. So um, why does it not have to get to that? How do we make sure it doesn't get to that? It's a great question, Tim. And most importantly, I don't want people to live in fear. They need to be prepared but not scared. Yeah, just, I just made there that up. Oh, I didn't know it. Yeah, prepared and not scared. Here's the thing. We're really good at treating COVID-19. But the key is you have to treat this illness early in the mildest stages, and then we're very good. It's absolutely wrong to stay at home while you're ill, waiting to get so sick that you need to end up in the emergency department. That is the wrong approach. We don't do that with any other disease. Imagine telling a woman who's newly diagnosed with breast cancer, sorry about that, you just stay at home. If it should get worse and spread, then you give me a call. We don't do that with any other disease, and we shouldn't do that with COVID. Yeah. You've heard about some of these repurposed medications. For some reason, they're controversial, despite the medical evidence showing that they are effective. Multi-drug regimens, when treated early, are very effective. So here's the key. Be prepared, not scared. And how do you be prepared? Before you're ill, find a doctor or access to somebody that can provide you with care and treatment. Are you ready for the word? Okay, you need a pen, do you need notes? If you do, please raise your hand or you'll regret it. You're gonna, want, you're gonna want the pen and the notes for this. Because the title of God's message for us today is Hearing God's Voice. It's a good one, huh? You ever had trouble hearing God's voice? Honestly? Have there been other times in your life when you have had no trouble hearing God's voice? Oh, I love those times. Um, listen to this verse, it's John 16, 12 through 13. It says, I still have many things to say to you. This is Jesus shortly before departing from earth. He said, I still have many things to say to you, but you can't hear them right now. When the spirit of truth comes, the spirit of God comes, the Holy Spirit, it says he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. Now, I don't see how anyone can read this verse that we just read and come to the conclusion that somehow God stopped speaking after the Bible was canonized, after the scriptures were, were finalized. Um, I just don't see it. He says so clearly, I still have a lot to say to you, but, I'm, but I'm, I'm leaving right now. And if you have opened your Bible and read it, you know that in the beginning he starts out speaking to Adam in the garden. And um, he... Ends it in Revelation, speaking to uh, John on the island of Patmos and all the books in between. What's happening? God speaking. God speaking. 4,000 some years. God speaking. Hundreds of times. God speaking. And even after the resurrection, after Jesus was crucified, died, was buried, what's the first thing that happens when he comes back? Talking to Mary. Walking, talking, right? In the garden. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And I see some of this going on. So, my guys in the, you guys in the back know, turn on the fans, keep it cool. And if, if everybody gets, you know, yeah, and the flies, all oh, these flies. Look, it's not like this all the time. I said that last week. But really, really, it's not. And Stephanie got this Irish spring. And are we putting it out? It's supposed to be magic against the flies. So we're going to be putting that around. It's just that somebody down the way dumped a lot of uh, fertilizer somewhere. And I guess we're downwind. So anyway, they'll take off. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I digress. Gosh, I'm so I ADHD. It's not hot. It's just the flies. All right, get some air moving. Let's do it. Um, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He made us in his image, right? Two ears, one mouth, right? So we can hear and we can speak. And we're made in God's image. God is a communicative God. He does speak. He wants to speak. And usually the barrier to his messages getting through 
to us is us. It's not him. And there's no biblical reason why God could not speak to a person audibly today. God speaking audibly is the exception usually. It's not, it's not the rule, but it ha- he, hey, God's God. He can do whatever he wants. Do we really think that the Holy Spirit, after the indwelling, okay, that means after you get saved and the Holy Spirit dwells in you, that's the indwelling, now lives in you, that he's going to speak to us less now that he's inside of us than he did before? I don't. So I've come up with 10 ways, and it's not all 10 because God is infinite, but there are 10 ways that you can verify in Scripture that the Lord speaks to us. I'm going to run through them kind of quick because then we're going to get to what you can do about that. Are you ready? Number one, the Bible. Everybody say Bible. Bible. Clearly, I don't want anyone to misunderstand me, the Bible is above every other way that God speaks. It is the primary, most prevalent, most important way that he speaks to us is ttb.org through the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. The very words of our God written through the minds and hands of men in a language for all of us to be able to understand. It is infallible. It is inerrant. It's the inspired Word of the living God. It's life to those who find it, health to their whole body, sweeter than honey, purer than gold, sharper than any two-edged sword, Cutting down to the very joints and marrow, it is our basic instructions before leaving earth. It is the manufacturer's warranty. It's the owner's manual. Manu means to make and all means refers to the maker. So you got the mind of the maker on paper. That is your Bible. Number one way God speaks. Job said, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily food. We should treasure what God says. It's his love story to humanity. It's his message to mankind. We ought to read it every single day, don't you think? No mode of communication will ever or should ever replace what the Bible says. It should never correct what the Bible says. It should never reframe or reposition anything that God wrote down in the Bible. Anything else God does say in any other way will simply affirm what's already in the Bible. In fact, that's the way you test it. Those other voices. That's the way you come to know, is this from God? Or is it some other voice? Because how many know there are some other voices? Yeah? Okay, this is interactive, so you can talk. Um, a little. <laughs> God is not the only spirit active in our world today. There are other voices that would love to speak to you and affect the way you live. And we'll talk about those in a little while. Number two way God speaks is His voice. His voice. I like 2 Samuel twenty two fourteen. 14. Here's an example. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered His voice. So here it is, His voice amidst the thunder. And then another verse you know out of 1 Kings 19, it says, And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small what? Voice. Pretty clear, God speaks through His voice. Now, like I said, it's not common, usually, I mean, for most people, with the hundreds of times that God did speak in the, in the Bible over 4,000 years, you know, it was just one way. It was His voice. But it is a way. Another way, number three, circumstances. You remember in the book of Jonah when God said, go to Nineveh, and Jonah went to Tarshish? <laughs> God couldn't have been more clear. Now, He spoke with His voice at that first time. Go to Nineveh. He said, no, I'm going to Joppa, catch a boat. Boat's going to Tarsus, the opposite direction of where God told him to go. So then, circumstances kind of change for Jonah. And uh, let me read this to you. It says, after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarsus to flee from the Lord. <laughs> Can you imagine? Like you're going to outrun God. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. And such a violent storm arose that the, sh- the ship threatened to break up. Circumstances was God speaking, was He not? You know there's more to the story. It's a great story. Have you ever had circumstance, have have you ever had something happen to you and you know, there is no, I I could stay up all night and not think of that, what what just happened in my life to, to change my course. It has to be God. And I know what he's saying. Anybody? I remember some years ago, we, were, uh, we had a little business in Corona. 
that was where our office was and a couple came by and they wanted to sell something and we were in the advertising business and this was an advertising item and it was worth a couple hundred bucks for sure all they wanted was 75 dollars it was a young couple they were either getting married or just married and they were trying to get back to illinois and they had they were down i mean they didn't have money and they were just seemed very very honest and humble and said we just want to we're just trying to gather up what we can so we can get back to family and, and get get on our feet so they only wanted 75 bucks and we talked about it our little little office crew and um we said let's go ahead and give them the 75 dollars but we told them you know what it's worth more than that why don't you go down here there's a company someone over there they'll probably give you a couple hundred for it so here's a blessing you know just here's 75 but you go sell it well we had a girl in the office we'll just call her sherry i don't know if there's any sherry's in here right but for the, for the purposes of discussion. So Sherry is the person who was getting the check and Natalie worked in the office, my sister, and Natalie goes back and says, oh, you're gonna write him a check for $75. She says, you're buying that thing? Like she's mad. And Natalie goes, oh yeah, yeah, well, well God blesses that. You know, she knew, she said, well, God blesses that, but we're not buying it. You're not buying it. No, we're just gonna give him the money. You're giving him the money. I mean, this girl did not understand. And she brought the check in like this threw it on the thing. I said, hey, Natalie, no, 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 God blesses that. And I was so proud of my little sister, you know, so we, we gave it to him and sent him down the road nicely with prayer and, you know, and uh, I think it was like two, three days later, we got a check in the mail, complete surprise check. It was seven thousand five hundred, like three dollars and some change. I mean, almost seven thousand five hundred three dollars and some change and um that's a circumstance that happened in my in my book and i know in natalie's book and i know god was speaking i know god was speaking and there were about four characters in this little scene um who was god speaking to i think probably everyone to the people who got the 75 bucks i bet now i'm not speaking for god this is hypothetical i don't claim to know what god said to them but I bet he reminded them that I'm looking out for you. Stay close to me as you travel. I got you. More than you even thought. To Natalie, I thought he was probably saying, at a girl, I love your childlike faith. Keep being my witness. And she said, no, no. He told me, help people. Help people. To Sherry, I know there was a message in there for her. It could have been, hey, I'm a really good God. I'm generous. I love taking care of my kids. And you know what? Maybe these crazy Christians you work with aren't so crazy after all. Because did you see the other check? And now to me, you know what he said? Clear. Your faith is too small. I'm like, he said, don't ever doubt me again. I'm like, Lord, when did, when did I doubt you? I, I was, remember, I was happy to give. He goes, yeah, you were, and I'm going to reward you for it. But you doubted my hundredfold blessing. And I said, what? He goes, you remember that verse you read? I think it's Matthew 13, 23. When I told you about the parable of the sower who scattered seeds on the, on, the, on the ground, remember a few years back in church, and I told you about rocky ground and thorns, and, and oh, by the way, but the seed which was sown on the good ground is... is um, <clears throat> represents the man who hears the message and understands it and really yields a return, sometimes 30, sometimes 60, sometimes 100-fold. He said, you doubted the blessing, the 100-fold blessing. How much was the check you wrote? I'm like, $75. <laughs> and how much was the check you got? $7,500 and three <laughs> and some change. He said, kid, the hundredfold blessing is just the beginning. You can't have small faith, he said. Don't do that again. I said, I know, Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I did, you're right. He said, don't do that again. He goes, that hundredfold is just the beginning, it's nothing for me. He said, I need you to believe that, or I'm going to have to find somebody who will. That's what I heard. And since that day, and I heard loud and clear, and since that day, guys, I have seen God do far more 
with far less. Amazing things. Last, um, and speak, speaking of amazing things, let me just tell you this. And this is not about money. But we've been business owners my whole life. I mean, our whole life. And when we kind of got the download from God, when we heard his voice about planning a church in 2020, we knew that if, if I were to accept the mantle, let's just say, as pastor, I could no longer be involved in our business on a daily basis, not by a long shot. Because I would need to be about his business. And I wasn't going to put my hand to the plow and look back in that way, if you know what I mean. I tell everybody at the company, which Brad runs, and he's back there, that I'm a full-time pastor, I'm managing consultant and trainer on occasion for the company. And I've told a lot of people over the years, you know, that you take care of God's business, he's going to take care of yours. And I meant it. But I got to tell you, 2020, when we planted this church, and I stepped out of the daily operations, stopped virtually all of our company's marketing because that was my main job, you know, getting the phone to ring, getting people to engage with what it is we did. did. In the midst of a pandemic, our business revenue tripled. And all I hear God say is, you take care of my business, I'll take care of yours. And I'm not, this, I want you to know I'm not preaching a prosperity gospel. This is about faith. This is not about money. You can't love that stuff or it will take you down. You cannot. If you are unhealthy, if you have an unhealthy attachment, if money has you and you don't have money, you, it's a matter of time, you will pay. <laughs> you will pay and you will, it, it will be very, um, it's just not healthy. It's not what God wants. It becomes an idol in our lives. And so this is not about that. This is about faith. And I think one of the reasons God does talk to us about money, though, there's a few of them, but one of the ones that I, I believe God uses, or one of, the, his, uh, one of the reasons, is because it's part of our everyday life. And it keeps people in bondage when they don't need to be in bondage because they don't know how they're going to pay their bills. It becomes a fearful thing. It becomes a materialistic thing. It becomes, I'm not happy and I'm not satisfied with God and everything he's given me, so I need something else, and I need something else. And how am I going to pay my bills? And it starts to affect the way we live and the way we make decisions. And it, it becomes an idol. Um, another reason is because I, I think God talks about it is because it's quantifiable. It means you can count it. How else can God demonstrate a hundredfold blessing if it never had an amount to start with to do the multiplication to just say 30, 60, and 100? Two talents, four, five talents, ten. It's quantifiable. It's for him to demonstrate how amazing he is. So anyway, a little bit off the topic, but isn't that interesting? Isn't God amazing? So number four way God speaks is counsel. Wise counsel, hopefully godly counsel. And this is all through Proverbs. not going to spend a lot of time on it. You can read it anywhere in Proverbs just about. Counsel uh, isn't just going to another person. It's because you're going to a person who's got some spiritual authority, a godly person, a person whom you trust, and that person will give you counsel because you're looking for counsel because you're trying to figure some things out in your own life. God does that all the time. That's why, as Christians, we're always in a place of, of uh, a protege, a Timothy, let's say, or a Stephen, or, or a Barnabas. We, 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 are, we might be receiving counsel, and we might be giving counsel. We might be receiving counsel. We might be giving counsel all through our life because there's always somebody who has been somewhere you've been who doesn't know what to do, but you do. And there's always somebody who's been somewhere you haven't been, and you don't know what to do, so you're talking to them. That's why we're supposed to do life together as Christians. God will use counsel and he will speak. And another way, number five, is peace. Peace. I love this one, Colossians 3.15. Let your heart be always guided by the peace of the anointed one who called you to peace as part of his one body. Let the peace of God rule in your heart. But if you look at the guided word, the word guided, I think, I don't know if I underlined it, but in my notes it's underlined. Because in the original um, Greek, guided, it, it's a word that is most closely related to umpire. The umpire. And, and so a referee. So if you think about it that way, let the peace in your heart, what do umpires do? Anybody? 
They call the shots. If the umpire doesn't say anything, you don't know if he's safe or out. You don't know if it was inbounds, out of bounds. You don't know the umpire speaks. And so it says, let the peace of God umpire your life. So God will speak to you through peace. How many have made a decision that seemed right in every way, but you didn't have peace? And you went through it and you go, I should have never done that because I didn't have the peace of God umpiring in my heart. Um, How many have made made another decision that made no natural sense and everybody you knew was telling me you are outside your mind, but you knew because you had a peace that that's the step you had to take. That's the way God speaks. Peace. Number six, people. People. So this is a little bit different than counsel. Counsel is something you seek after, but people, sometimes God just uses people that cross your path to deliver a message and speak to you. And he'll use you to do the same to them. Acts 9, 17, that's a verse. I I won't go into it too much, but um, Ananias, there's another place where Agabus spoke to Paul and he just... He, there's, you can, I got references in here, so we don't have to be here all day with this, but you guys can go look these verses up. If you question any of them, you shouldn't take my word for it. You should take God's word for it. So go look. Number seven, dreams and visions. Dreams and visions. I can never remember my dreams. Doggone it. I shouldn't say that. Every once in a while I do for till breakfast. <laughs> but God speaks. I know many people get dreams visions, write the vision, because God gave it to you, write it, make it plain upon tablets. You can look all through your Bible, Solomon, Jacob, Ezekiel, Peter, John, Paul, Joseph, on and on. Dreams and visions is a way God speaks, and you can't get more personal than that, because nobody else is involved except you and him. Number eight, thoughts. God speaks to me through my thoughts, impressions. Yeah. Am I going too fast? Okay. 1 Corinthians 2.16, For who can know the thoughts of the Lord? Who knows enough to teach Him? But we understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. That's the mind of Christ. God's transforming our mind. Be not conformed, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. As God renews our mind, we take on the mind of Christ. And yes, God speaks to us through thoughts. Amen? Okay, next one. Natural manifestations. I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, revelation. Natural manifestations. God can speak through those. Since creation, in, in Romans 1.20, you can look at that. It says, since creation, God's always made himself obvious through that which he made. You can see it. You can see it. We had on Easter Sunday... Was anybody here for sunrise service? Let me see your hands. Okay. Remember... When we got done, we were, we were just standing out there with a fire, dark, it's getting lighter and lighter, and we just finished, and just said amen, and I don't know what time it was, six o'clock in the morning, but look what God did. Yeah. I mean, right there, you see the sun coming up? That's just right there, like right there. He's just like saying, I wasn't just there on Calvary, I'm here now too. Amen. God speaks through natural manifestations. He also speaks through supernatural manifestations. There's some references in your Bible, Exodus, Judges, Numbers. So how about a burning bush, right? Supernatural. How about fleece, wet or dry, with Gideon? How about a talking donkey? There's a lot of good jokes that could go with that, but I'm not going to say one of them. All right. Um, manifestations, natural and supernatural. So there's 10 ways. But what I want to know is how can I hear better? Because even with all those ways and more, sometimes I still can't hear what he's saying to me. Anybody like me? Okay, number one or number A, letter A for your notes is value God's voice. Value God's voice. You've got to put a value on it. It has to have a priority in your life. Do you know there's no such thing as a neglected priority? Huh? I know. I thought about this years ago and wrote a little article about it. But what it was is what if you look up the definition of priority, it's something that is given special attention. So all this time I thought I was neglecting my priorities. What I realized 
from God speaking to me is, son, your priorities are out of whack. That's not it. Don't say this is a priority, this is a priority, this is a priority, I'm a priority. You don't spend any time on this, 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 or me. You're kidding yourself because priorities are defined by what we do, not what we say or what we think or what we might have on some little list. Am I right? That's painful because I'm like, oh, there's no such thing as a neglected priority. So we make time for whatever we value. Shout out a favorite pastime. Anybody? Anybody? Sports. All right. Fishing. Yeah, some people, they go fishing for days and go buy stuff and read articles. That's a lot of time. That's nothing wrong with that. That's great. It's a gift. But you value it, so you make time for it. Anybody else? What else? Sporting events. Sporting events. Alec. Bowling. Bowling. Ha <laughs> ha. That's a good one. If you like bowling. <laughs> Sleeping. Yeah. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and the enemy will come on you like a bandit in the night. Something like that. Um, what other things? Social media, Facebook. And sometimes we don't even set out to spend time on those priorities, but you can tell what a person values by looking at their calendar and their purchases. You can tell. God values us. He values us so much that He died for us and He wants to spend time. He wants even to be our friend. He said, I no longer call you servants, I call you friends. And he explained why. I want to show you what might be a different way of looking at God's message to you. You've all heard the verses about giving, right? Uh, giving it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Men shall give. I, in fact, I said it last week. But with the measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you, right? We, we've heard that. Sowing and reaping, you know. Um, and when we hear those, we associate that with stewardship, do we not? And stewardship we usually equate with what? Money, most of the time. Listen to this verse out of Mark 4, 24 and 5. Then he said to them, take heed what you hear. Everybody say that. Take heed what you hear. Okay. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. He's not talking about money. He's saying what you hear, what I say to you. It'll be measured back to you, and to you who hear, more will be given. That's amazing. For whoever has understanding, whoever has knowledge, whoever has my word in a valuable, in a valuable perspective, to him or her will be given more. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Stewardship of God's message? Yeah, that's why we're here. The message of God is the reason we're here. I have it in another translation from the NLT. He says, then he added, pay close attention to what you hear. The closer you listen, the more understanding you'll be given and you will receive even more. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That means God saying what he gives us in a dream or a vision or a circumstance or a natural manifestation or any of those other ways or his word is so is so valuable that you're going to be held accountable like the like the um like the guys you know that buried their talents and and got the master you're going to be held accountable with what you did with it so everything god gives us is to be stewarded even and especially what he says that was a revelation for me God's entrusted us with something, and it's a treasure. And with the same measure we use, it's coming back. So that was letter A. Let's go to letter B. So first, you've got to value his voice. Second thing is recognize. You recognize how through relationship. I'm going to read John 10, 26. But you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Okay, so a shepherd's out in the pasture. Many days. He's got a staff and his voice, maybe a dog. I don't know what else, but the sheep know his voice. He gives commands. They spend a lot of time together. He says, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. So in this illustration, the sheepfold represents a place of security, 
a pasture with a fence or a protective shelter of the family of God. No one can enter the fold except through the good shepherd. He alone determines who may come in. He protects his sheep and he leads them. He even lays down his life. And relationship with God should be our absolute highest priority. Number one, if it is, then you'll recognize his voice when he speaks, just like the sheep know the voice of the shepherd. Who can remember the days before caller ID? It wasn't that long ago. Can you imagine if I call my wife Lucinda and she answers the phone, says hello in her beautiful little voice, and I go, hello, sugar. And she's like, who's this? And I say, it's Brett. And what if she said, Brett who? I would be so hurt. I'd be like, don't you recognize my voice? What do you mean, Brett who? How many Bretts do you know? But that would never happen because she knows my voice. She even wrote me a little love note one time. And is this this little note on an office piece of stationery? really doesn't have much to do with the message, but maybe it does. She said, I'm sitting here working and I hear you, you know, coming and going. It was a separate part of the building. And she said, I might, it might seem s- strange, but I know the sound your footsteps make. I'm like, man, I treasure that little note. Little lips on the bottom, whatever. <laughs> no, did you do that? Did it have lips? I don't want to misquote. Okay. My, one of my favorite notes of all time. But we spend time together. She knows the steps, you know, the footsteps. We know... Um, we recognize God's voice from being with him. It's a very simple principle. We spend so much time together, we finish each other's sandwiches. (laughs) Right? (laughs) It's a very simple principle, but how many know simple is not always easy? Sometimes simple things are hard to do. When I go to God, or when we go to God, I would think it was safe to say most of us want direction, generally. I want direction. Lord, should I go to this? Should our kids go to this school? Or should we move to this state? Or should we go to this church? I mean, we want direction. But that's not what relationships are all about. I mean, she, my wife again, Lucinda, probably doesn't mind me giving her direction. I don't mind her giving me direction, but that's not why we hang out together. We can imagine if we spent the whole weekend and all I did was give you direction. She'd probably be like, yeah, <laughs> that wouldn't be good. That's not what relationships are all about. It's about spending quality time together. Does that make sense? If you were in the hospital, let's say you've got friends that write books. And we have a couple of people in this church that have written and published books. Let's just say I'm one of them. I'm one of the authors. And I come, you're in the hospital, and I come and I drop off some books, good self-help books, good spiritual books, good things are going to help you. I leave them at the desk for you, and I'm out. But then let's say Steve over here, he writes books, and he comes over, and he brings them, but he comes to your room, and he spends some time with you, and he talks to you, and he prays with you. And maybe you can't talk because maybe you got tubes or whatever. Maybe he just sits there and spends time with you. Who would you rather have come visit? The one that's going to spend time with you. And I feel sometimes like people feel like God just dropped off some books that he wrote, a book of many books that are one book. They just drop them off in case, you know, you get around to reading it. But the author wants to spend time with you. He's got the book. It'll always be there for you. But he wants to spend time with you. Literally time. It's hard for us to grasp. Why would God want to spend time with me or you? I, I, it's beyond us. But he's that kind of God. And so we have to know that. We're going to learn to recognize his voice by spending time with him. And remember what the verse said about stewardship. To, to those who, who guard it and value it, they're going to be given more. You're going to understand more. Wow, I would like to understand more than what I understand now. Wouldn't you? I mean... Remember when we didn't know anything? And now we know something, but I really want to know more. God says, it's not hard. Just hang out with me. C, letter C. Set an appointment. Set an appointment. Listen to this out of Exodus 19, 10, 
11, 19, I got some verses here. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. And what was God doing? He was setting an appointment. That's what he's doing. He says, get them ready, have them get cleaned up for the next two days, prepare, prepare. And then on the third day, I'm coming. And then 19b, further down in the passage, it says, and God answered him by voice. God was setting an appointment. We make time for whatever it is that's important to us. I think most of us in this church would say, yeah, I want to I, I wanna, I wanna hear from God more. I really want to hear him, but I'm having a hard time. I want to hear him better. But most people do not set an appointment. Not everybody. Some of you do. And I just love you guys. Inspire me. How valuable is hearing God to you? We set appointments with people we don't even like. All the time. Why? Because things we believe are important need to get handled. And getting them handled requires communication. It requires an exchange of burdens, an exchange of, of information. And just think if you were disciplined like that, and some of you I know are, but imagine you got people over and they're staying and holiday is over, but they're still there and they're staying a really long time and it's nighttime and you go, you know what guys, girls, I love you guys. You stay as long as you want. Mi casa, su casa, but I gotta go because I got an appointment in the morning. Everyone understands that. I got an appointment and I'm keeping it. What would God do with that special, specific time that you set aside just for him? What would he do? A lot. Give you more. There's only one way to find out if you don't know. And the next one for your notes, D, is prepare the environment. Prepare the environment. Oh, you mean I can't just rush into God's presence? Well, you can. And we all have. And we do. And you're always welcome. Just like a parent at work and the Daughter or son can, it's open door policy when it comes to the kids. You come on in, whatever you want. But God comes to a prepared environment. Listen to this. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. God comes to a prepared environment. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Starting out with worship. Starting out with God. You are amazing. The very first lines of the Lord's Prayer. And that's why we typically start church service with worship. These people, these wonderful people are not just up here singing. They're preparing an environment. They're eliminating distractions. They're praising God. They're preparing our hearts, your hearts, their hearts. They're, they're rolling out the red carpet. That's what they're doing. They're saying, Holy Spirit, we honor you. Holy Spirit, come. Holy Spirit, this is your house and this is your house. We can't wait to see you. We can't wait to experience you. We can't wait to hear what it is you have to say and to receive those amazing truths that you want to write on the tablet of our heart. In 2 Chronicles, this is so important to prepare the environment, guys. In 2 Chronicles, um, I'm going to read you a little bit out of there. It says, the Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men. This is um, King Jehoshaphat. It's a great story where... Um, they're in battle. They're in between battle. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord came upon one of the men standing there. Listen, all you people of Judah and Jerusalem, and listen, King Jehoshaphat. Jump in Jehoshaphat. He said, This is what the Lord says. Do not be afraid. Don't be discouraged by this mighty army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march out against them. And then he says, You won't even have to fight. Take your positions, stand still, and watch the Lord's victory. After consulting the people, the king appointed singers. He put the worshipers out in front. He said, singers, go ahead, walk ahead, sing to the Lord, praise him for his holy splendor. And at the moment they began to sing and give praise, the Lord caused the armies to start fighting among themselves. The enemy, the enemy massacred themselves. They just, they did away with themselves. And you know, today that, that valley, it says here in, in the verse on the fourth day, they gathered in the valley of blessing, which got its name that day because the people praised and thanked the Lord there. It's still called the valley of blessing today. Second Chronicles. So, it started with hearing God. And then it 
It went to praising God. And the very best way I know how, I'm just going to tell you, the very best way I know how to hear God is to get alone with Him, worship Him, somehow, whether it's with music or with something that you do for Him, a craft or, or quiet time or laying on the floor, whatever you do, worship Him to prepare the environment, focus on Him, tune out all distractions. Well, I don't think very many of us are very good at this. I know it took me years. I'm still not that great at it. Um, give Him all your burdens. All of them. I remember when I first really started to walk with the Lord, I, would, I felt like I had so much stress that in the nighttime, I would have to, to sleep. I would like, Lord, and I would see myself, and I have all this stuff, and I would just like, ah, like just push it away in prayer, like take it, God. And then in the morning, get up. Praise Him, worship Him, talk to Him, quiet time. Okay, and I start to, start to take some of that back because now my name, not to, t- not to take burdens back, but whatever responsibilities there were that I had to engage with that day. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's just a visual. But the, we- the best way I know is turn out all distractions. Give yourself some time. Don't do it on the fly. Read your Bible. Open that sucker, that thing, that, that word of God, I mean. <laughs> Open it. That's where you read it, on the inside. We already know the outside, Holy Bible. But the inside has a lot of good stuff in it. So find a spot. And I don't recommend the open it up and, you know, just do it. But I've done that. And I've told many of you, I'm not going to tell you, I'll save it for another sermon. But open it up and just read it. And ask the Lord, what do you want to tell me today? And he may tell you and he may not tell you right then. Stick with it. Read some more. Read some more. Maybe you close it for a little while. And maybe you sit there and you go, Lord... Well, what do you what do you want to say to me today? And just write it down. Yeah. Write it down. Now I know guys especially. Oh, I don't do dear diary. No, it's not dear diary. It's recording. There, there's a famous quote that says, "Thoughts and ideas disentangle themselves as they pass through the lips and fingertips." And so I have journals, and I'm telling you, if my house caught on fire as soon as I got the family out I'd be back in there for the journals I don't care about the couch or the TV or whatever but where are my journals because in my journals I recorded some things in a very unorganized haphazard way where God said something to me that I knew that I needed to keep that and hang on to it so that's the best way give yourself 15 minutes try it with 15 try it with 20 try it with a half hour give yourself some time God will show up and he'll speak to you and you'll jot something down and I was going to do it today but I don't think I will now in the interest of time But you will end up writing something and you will find out so often that what you wrote is exactly what you needed that day. But you never would have really known if you didn't stop and connect in that way. The ability to hear God is innate. It's in you. You're born again into it. Let me say it that way. Does that make sense? So it's innate. It's also learned. And it also matures. So you have it, but you got to develop it. The more you develop, the more it matures. The more it matures, the more you walk with God on a level that you never walked with God before. The more you hear, the more you see. Because there's a human element and there's a human will that will get in the way if you don't take steps to be closer to God. So number E, or letter E for your notes, coming down to the end here, it's a caveat. Caveat's a warning, a proviso, uh, a lookout. It's a red flag. Sin causes us to avoid God's voice. It does? Sure. It does. Quick example, Genesis 3.10. Adam and Eve in the garden, they've already disobeyed and rebelled. And they hear God walking in the cool of the day, right? Walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And he says, where are you, Adam? Of course he knows. Adam says, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, I don't think, at least not for our recording, or our, our, for us to be able to see, I don't think God ever heard that from anybody. I heard your voice, and I was afraid. Anyone on earth, no one had been here before. That was the beginning. Adam had no reason to ever be afraid before that, but he heard his voice because he knew what he did, and he was afraid. So, yeah, you're not hearing from God. Maybe there's something you need to purge or ask God to help you purge from your life. 
I mean, just a simple thing like husbands and wives who fight all the time. It says your, your prayers aren't going past the ceiling. I'm not going to listen to your prayers when you can't even treat each other like humans. That's just one little example. So sin will cause us to avoid God's voice. And we have to remember that God is not the only spirit active in this world. Right? He's not. The devil can stir our hearts and our minds too. There are dark forces. What does the Bible call them? The prince of the power of the airwaves. Airwaves are how we communicate. Wi-Fi and satellite and even now speakers, right? You think God doesn't, you think the devil doesn't want to try to intercept the message coming out of that speaker right before it gets to your ear, Renee, and just twist it a little bit? But more importantly, and this is where we'll close, letter F, God wants to talk to us. He wants to talk to us. He wants to talk to us. Please, if you're a parent in here and you've ever had a season of detachment from your own kids where you just, you just want to talk to them, you just want to, just some kind of response, you know, just a phone call or just sit at the dinner table and say something back. I just want to talk to you, my child. Every parent knows what that feels like if you've ever had a child that, stiff-armed you. God wants to talk to you. Remember the verse we started with, I still have many things to say to you. And here's a closing verse. Long ago in many ways and at many times God's prophets spoke His message to our ancestors, but now at last God sent His Son to bring His message to us. That's the voice of God. God sent His Son to bring His message to us. God created the universe by His Son, and everything will someday belong to the Son. God's Son has all the brightness of God's own glory, is like Him in every way. By His own mighty word, He holds the universe together. That's the crux of the matter. There is a way that seems right unto man, but in the end it leads to destruction. But there is another way and a truth and a life. And the only way to get back to the Father is through Jesus Christ, God's Son. It's the only way. Personal relationship with Jesus Christ is the whole reason that God speaks. That's the reason. And if He's the way, and we know He is, you never have to be lost. And if He's the truth, and we know He is, you never have to live under the, under the deception of lies. And if He's the life, then no devil in hell can ever kill you. Because he's about eternal life. You want to know you're forgiven? Jesus. You want to be redeemed from the curse of sin? God's son. You want to have an abundant life? God's son. You want to beat your enemy at every turn? Jesus Christ is the answer. You want to learn how to love? You want to learn how to love? The love of Christ, the light of Christ, the light of the world. You want to have blessed relationships? an amazing marriage? You want to live your purpose? Do you want to help people find the love that maybe you have found? Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's what we're supposed to share. You want to live forever? Man, I saw a movie last night and the lady said, that she was, she, the woman was, had a cancer. She was talking to her kids and thought she was going to die. And he said, he said, Mom, I don't want you to die. And she said, Honey, when I'm in the next room, she goes, I don't really think of death like that. I don't, I don't even believe in it. She goes, when I'm in the next room, she said, am I dead? He goes, no. She said, where am I? She says, you're, you're in the next room. And he, she said, that's right. I'm just in the next room. And you know you're going to see me before long. Eternal life. This life is like a vapor, a whisper. It's here today, gone tomorrow. You want to bring honor and glory to God? I don't know why anyone would ever want to miss that. So if you're in this room and you belong to Jesus, can you just say, I do? Can we take a vow and say, I do? Is there anybody else? Keep your hands up. Come on. He said, acknowledge me. Acknowledge me before men. I'll acknowledge you before my father. That's what he said. I see hands all over the place. Phil! Wake up! I know he's there. He's with us. All right. All right. Let's say a prayer. You can repeat after me if you believe. Lord Jesus! I believe. I believe. I want to hear your voice every day of my life. I want to be a good steward. I want to spend time with you. I'm sorry for my sinful ways. Thank you for forgiving me and taking my sin 
as far as the east is from the west and making me white as snow. I love you. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. And everybody in God's tent said, Amen. Amen and Amen. If the Lord spoke to you, give Him a praise today.